thank you for coming to this lecture, which was created in honor of my late husband, will miller, a social justice activist and professor of philosophy who taught at uvm for thirty five years and who passed away six years ago. i want to say i want to thank the board of the lecture series for their work in helping to determine topics for these lectures and for their help in securing speakers such as michael parenti who are current on the issues that will would have wanted us to continue discussing co-sponsors for this event include the uvm english department and the james and mary brigham buckham foundation global justice ecology project the will miller green mountain veterans for peace and the uvm chapter of the international international socialist organization i would like to thank all of you who have recently made donations to the lecture series you help us continue to bring important topics to consider and to invite impressive political speakers to our community i encourage those of you here tonight to make donations as well without your support we could not do this work donation containers will be passed around along with clipboards for you to share your names and addresses and emails for us to keep you informed about our work and the work of other progressive organizations which we support consider joining our facebook page as well as another way to hear about our work i want to let you know that we have a limited number of copies of michael's latest book the face of imperialism to sell tonight at the table on the way out we'd like you to support a locally owned independent bookstore and michael by purchasing his books here tonight. As our logo, logo for the lecture series says, Will will always be remembered as a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Our mission is to bring speakers to the UVM campus and the Burlington community, providing a continuing program of radical analysis of social, ecolo ecological, and political concerns. Will was an amazing social justice activist. When he spoke, we listened. As we say in our mission statement, Will set a courageous example in speaking truth to power. His voice was powerful, especially in encouraging other voices to speak up and be heard. He had an unwavering commitment to the struggle against war and for social justice, and he had an amazing ability to move others into action. He would be so incredibly proud of the faculty members, staff, and students who are continuing to speak out in the name of social justice, both on and off campus. Will would, be with all, Will would be with all of you working in the Occupy movement here in Vermont and nationally. Now at this time, I'd like to invite Keith Bruner to come up and give us a brief description about what's going on at Occupy Burlington, and then I'll do the introduction of Michael. You know what I'm going to do it without, can everyone hear me if I speak like this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I just came up from the park. Uh, things are very interesting at the park right now. We have an occupied City Hall Park. Before I get to that though, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Occupy movement. Um, I was in New Jersey a few weeks ago and I saw in my local county paper there was an editorial by Emmanuel Wallerstein, the World System Scholar, saying that this is the most important thing to have happened since 1968. Um, political, economically, uh, and that was really exciting for me to see that in a very small paper. I was like, wow, this is, this is really momentous. Um, here in Burlington, we started an occupation uh, two Fridays ago. Uh, we have been there, it's been working out. Um, we have, I want to say, probably like 40 tents, give or take. Um, it's been a fluctuating population, and it's really become a very interesting space uh, because we've been able to have a direct dialogue with folks who uh, we're actually living either on the streets or living in the park before we got there. Um, so that was something that I think a lot of people didn't see coming, was the opportunity for people from all stripes to begin to interact, um, and especially interacting with people who are uh, being not served at all by our current um, political system. Uh, so today we had a really unfortunate um, situation, uh, a man who I knew pretty well, um, He's been there, down there for a while. Uh, he uh, has been living uh, in or near the park for many years, is what he told me. Um, he, it looks like he uh, 
uh, took his life today, uh, early in the afternoon, um, and he passed away about two hours ago. Um, so that kind of precipitated, uh, precipitated a situation. We all went down there, the police went down there, um, they cordoned off an area. Uh, the area that was initially cordoned off was the area where the main tents are. Um, that uh, area, people were um, very emotional. Emotions were running high because uh, this man who we knew very well, who I was told is an Iraq war vet, um, and I think was struggling with alcoholism. Um, so he was, he, and was not being served uh, by our kind of current systems. Um, actually, a little addendum is the Committee on Temporary Shelter has been sending people, uh, they've been full, they've been sending people to the occupation. So we've really been uh, housing and feeding people um, who aren't able to get their services that they need. Uh, so, yeah, the park got uh, cordoned off. Um, we had a general assembly at 5 o'clock and talked about what do we do if uh, this looks like a longer term thing uh, under the guise of cleaning uh, or other things, other occupations have been moved and then this space has been taken by the police uh, and they haven't been able to get back in. Um, we had a conference with the chief of police and the mayor uh, at 6 o'clock. Um, while we were at that conference, the police decided to expand uh, the area that they had cordoned off and were rousting everyone from the entire southern part of City Hall Park. This is downtown. Um, people were very afraid of that. Uh, came into the conference. We had a big mic check in the middle of this conference. Everyone got up, headed outside. There was a line of police. A lot of tensions were running high. A young woman was, uh, was grabbed by police and led off to be arrested. Um, the mayor came out. He's currently apparently speaking on the steps uh, in City Hall Park. Um, so it's really an interesting situation. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what the future of the occupation is. Um, so I guess I wanted to finish by just saying uh, what we're about to hear is really very important. Um, talking about some of the systemic causes of these local issues that we have. Uh, and I'd like to encourage people that when this is over, um, please come down to the park. I just got a text saying mass arrest possible, please come to the park ASAP. Um, and I think I'm actually gonna head down there right now. But uh, yeah, after the talk, come on down uh, and enjoy it. This is gonna be awesome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Parenti spoke at UVM was in April 1997, 25 years after being fired by the UVM trustees. It is so very appropriate at this time that I use Will's words, which he used to introduce Michael 25 years ago. Actually, 15 years ago, I think, was when, he, um, when these words were written. Um, Michael Parenti was the target of a political firing by the UVM Board of Trustees in the academic year 1972, 1971 to 1972, an extraordinary overturning of the usual procedures for academic reappointment. For the first and only time in UVM's history, the trustees overrode the entire university evaluation process and fired by refusing to reappoint Parenti for failing to display, quote, public uh, profession, profession, unprofessional conduct, a requirement that trustees invented after the fact to justify their decision. Michael had the support and approval of his colleagues in the political science department, the College of Arts and Science, and the University Senate. Administratively, he was supported by his department chairperson, the college dean, and the president of UVM. Still, the trustees, who lacked any serious academic credentials, took it upon themselves to remove one of the most popular professors and published scholars on the campus. All the instances of so-called unprofessional conduct, which the trustees gave as reasons for their actions, were constitutionally protected acts of free speech. UVM was placed under censure by the American Association of University Professors, AAUP and by the American Political Science Association. An international legal defense fund was established on his behalf by academics all across the United States as well as from Europe and Canada. The case received national press attention from the Boston Globe to Time Magazine. In response, UVM faculty pledged funds to create the Thomas Jefferson Chair of Critical Studies 
to keep Michael on campus while his case went to court. However, UVM's President Andrews caved into pressure from the trustees to refuse to allow Michael's courses to be taught on campus or for credit. Let me step aside from Will's words here to say that starting this summer, with the help of Alex Buckingham, I have been going through all of the papers and files that Will created as his legacy. More than 30 years of left organizing records are chronicled in these papers. Will had always wanted to have a politically left archive in our home in Westford, available for others to use. I am now in the process of figuring out where this archive will be kept in perpetuity. As for the connection to Michael Parenti, an extraordinary set of archival materials exists containing such items as newspaper clippings, articles, and lists of people who worked tirelessly to help keep Michael at UVM. For example, the pledge lists containing the names of those UVM professors who were willing to offer a portion of their salaries to keep Michael employed um, at UVM are in this file. The box has just an amazing, it is an, an amazing treasure trove of articles from that time period and an analysis of what happened from different people. Now let me go back to Will's words about Michael. It was a sad day in the history of the university and a dismal episode in the struggle for academic and political freedom when Michael was fired. While UVM recanted its firing in 1954, in, in 1954 of Alex Novikov for his refusal to testify and name names before a witch-hunting congressional committee by giving him an honorary degree in 1983, it has sought to bury the Parenti firing. In the official history, the University of Vermont, the first 200 years, the Parenti case is barely mentioned and seriously incomplete or inaccurate in what it does note. Dr. Parenti's return will serve to remind members of the community how much we lost when the trustees went beyond their intended institutional role of financial advisors to the university and decided that certain ideas they found personally distasteful were not to be a part of the, uni the universe of free discourse on the campus. The Parenti firing was a watershed event in UVM's history. Instead of opposing the trustees by whatever means were necessary, the faculty allowed itself to be sidelined by waiting for it to be settled in courts. After the firing of Parenti, the way was cleared to remove other left anti-war radical faculty. A purge of the philosophy department was begun by the same administration which had been called, which had been called to task by the trustees for forcing them to fire Parenti themselves. Having learned from the Parenti case, no reasons were given for the philosophy firings so that litigation against UVM would be more difficult. Before the decade of the 70s ended, Howard Waitzkin and Ralph Underhill of sociology would also fall to casualties in the, in the campaign to narrow the range of ideas, theories, and critique that can be safely entertained and discussed at UVM. The demoralization and fear engendered at UVM by this repression persists today. Now, 40 years after his firing, we are fortunate to have Michael here on campus again to enlighten us with his wisdom and insight, and to energize us to continue in the great fight for social justice. Michael Parenti. to see if you can make Michael cry. <laughs> um, and everything you said, Anne, was true, except it hasn't been 40 years. It's been like 12, I think. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, I'm going to talk about empire because the empire is, is happening right now and <clears throat> doing itself on us. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? yeah. It just doesn't have enough pickup. I have to lean. That's what the sound engineers, they go, Testing, testing. Now, who gives a lecture like this? Can you can read your notes? You know what I mean? So, what? You can't lift it up, sweetheart. No, whenever I go someplace, they say, you need a PowerPoint, you need slides. You need 
I said, no, all I, all I need is, um, all I need is to be left alone while I'm talking. In a couple of books. <laughs> How's that? Oh, that's, a, that's a help. Thanks a lot, Mike. No, I, I would say all I need is, a, a, is a, a good sound system and some water. And sometimes I get the water, you know. <laughs> but not this time I didn't get any. <laughs> Well, the, let, let me say something about empire because it's, it's right on our necks. It's happening to us. It's destroying people's lives in many parts of the world. Um, I mean, to have your life shattered, to have everything, your community, your profession, your home, your family, uh, by drones that are coming in and killing you for humanitarian reasons is, is very hard and very horrible. And we live in the belly of that monster. The U.S. has an empire as never before seen in human history. There has never been an, an empire of this scope and this power. Over 700 military bases and troops, troops in about 80 or 90 countries. That's extraordinary. The U.S. spends more on military than all other nations combined. You know, there's all the, that the Republican resistance to a stimulus package, which guaranteed no, no relief from the recession. Uh, but we have a stimulus package every year. We've been having this since 1947, 46. Uh, and, that, and that's the military budget. That's the military allocation. It's $780 million a year. Um, and it's about, um, it's about all that the... Uh, the federal government does in, in the way of creating jobs, it seems. It's an empire without colonies, of course, as you know, because um, uh, that day is gone. Colonel Blimp's day is gone. You don't, you don't have to bring your troops, plant your flag, annex the country. You let the country have itself, and you just take what you want out of it. Uh, de Tocqueville had a great quote in, in, in uh, Democracy of the Theory, and I can't remember it, but look it up sometime. <laughs> That's called preparation. It, it, was, it, was, it, was something like, it was something like how he says, he says um, the, 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 merchant, uh, the merchant doesn't really want power, he just wants the, the money that, that he can get out of the situation. He doesn't want to have to take care of the whole overhead. I forget what it was, but let me tell you my, my, my statement. Um, it's called neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism. And, and neo-colonialism means you don't send Colonel Blimp down, you don't occupy and, and own the country um, the way the Brits did with India for over 120 years or more. What, what am I saying? 160 years or so. Um, it's more like what the Americans did in Cuba. That was one of the earliest, not the earliest, but one of the earliest uh, of neo-colonialism. We went to the Cubans in 1902 about, and we said, uh, U.S. leaders said, you know, we stole you from the Spaniards fair and square, um, but it doesn't look good. You know, we're a republic, and we can't have uh, colonies and, and that sort of thing. So we're going to give you your independence, you're going to have your own flag. It's going to be red, white, and blue, with, and, and you get only one star on it because you're just a little island. You know, one star is enough for you. And you get your own. You're going to get your own currency. You're going to have Jose Marti on the currency. You don't have to have George Washington. We're flex. We're flex. With this. So, and you got your own presidente, and and you're going to have your own constitution. In fact, here it is, because our Spanish isn't that good. Check it, check it up. And, and, um, and, and all, we, all we will have in return for all of this generosity, all this care, and all this expense we're going through, all we'll have in return is um, we'll control your sugar, only control your sugar industry, your tobacco industry, your nickel refineries, your mines, your tourist industry, and all your relations with third countries, other countries. So you're free, you're independent now. So as you can see, uh, the goal is not glory of empire, the goal is the gold of empire. Um, with the third world countries having nominal independence, but today the giant transnational corporations control most of the land, labor, resources, and markets of many of these countries. 
great profits for transnational corporate investors, great impoverishment for the people of these countries, and great blood spilling. One of the things that empires do, I, I discovered, and it's not never talked about that much, you know, they, they kill enormous numbers of people. They just slaughter and kill. Right, right now, I mean, the number of people killed in Iraq, the number of people killed in Libya by these drones and by these mercenary uh, units that have come in and, and these um, Islamic militant and Al-Qaeda groups that are CIA funded, a la early Afghanistan, uh, the, the, the killings that have gone on e everywhere, I mean, the, the, the 78 days of bombing in Yugoslavia, I remember going there uh, a week after the bombings had stopped and uh, horrified by what I saw. Um, oh, thank you. <coughs> so they kill a lot of people. I mean, the taking of the North American continent killed hundreds of thousands of, of people here. Indigenous peoples. <coughs> Um, now, usually you hear the opposite. You hear that capitalism, these, I was mentioning these transnational corporations investing and coming in. Capitalism brings prosperity. I mean, we're taught that, right, since, since pretty early. You're told that all the time. Now, I want to demonstrate the contrary. I want to prove to you that your lifetime of propaganda that you got on that point is wrong. But you have to give me 15, 20 seconds to do it, okay? Okay, here's how I'll do it. One, one, most of the world is capitalist and most of the world is poor, not prosperous. Two, in those parts of the world where capitalist investment has little or no regulation imposed on it, the populations are poorest. The investors enjoy the highest rate of return, the highest margin in those places. Um, three, the more free trade and free market the world becomes, the poorer it becomes. The number of people living in poverty today is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. That means poverty is spreading so capitalism is not spreading prosperity. The more capitalist a country becomes, the poorer it is. Consider capitalist Indonesia. Consider capitalist Guatemala, capitalist Mexico, capitalist Nigeria, capitalist India. With a, with a, with a, uh, now in India's case and a few of those cases, there's also a, an immense substratum of feudalism involved too, but these feudalists are hand in glove with the capitalists. And the same with the, within the United States. The more free trade, the more free markets, the more income inequality, the more economic hardship for the 99% and the more wealth for the 1%. Well, <clears throat> what is this US global empire? Well, besides being a network of all these military bases all over the world, besides having these massive carrier, aircraft carrier, uh, uh, atomically armed fleets that make port on every continent in the world and floating all over that. They also have a global network of military and security forces in all these countries. I mean, uh, made up of the troops uh, in these countries uh, and paramilitary forces and police uh, uh, all over the globe. All of them financed, equipped, advised, trained by the US Pentagon the CIA, and related agencies. In Africa, for instance, 50 nations over time, not, not all at the same time, but over time, 50 nations have received extensive military aid from the United States over these last decades. 50. There's only 53 countries in Africa, so 50 out of 53. Um, but I, I have to I have to part company with people like Chalmers Johnson who thinks this empire is just there for power, that these people just seek power for power's sake. Not at all. They're very rational. They're very, very rational. They have a very keen understanding of their own um, 
of their own interests. The empire is not just motivated by power for power's sake. It's, it's, it's a, power is an instrument of empire, not the end all. The goal is to expropriate the wealth of the world. The second goal, the subsidiary goal, is to make the world safe for the expropriators. So there may be times when you have to take out a nation, not because the nation has oil that you want, not because they're threatening anything. Oh, no, that's it. Because they can somehow be a threat in some way, you see. I mean, why did the United States invade Grenada? You remember Ronald Reagan? His greatest victory, Grenada. 102,000 people. But that wasn't stupid, that wasn't excessive, that wasn't fear of the Soviets. That's what he told you, that, oh, there, there, are, there are shipping lines and the Soviets might choke hold these shipping lines right from Grenada into the Caribbean and they're very strategic. Suddenly, Grenada was the most strategic place in the whole globe, you see. No, they went into Grenada to serve notice to every other country in the Caribbean that if you have a revolutionary movement like this, if you start building communal farms, if you start giving out free education and free medical care, if you kick out our co companies and corporations or take them over, this is what's going to happen to you. We'll come right down on your neck like we came down on the Grenadians. It's the, it's the, um, the, ex it's the, it's the threat of the good example. And that's something that is not to be tolerated. So there, the subsidiary goal, to make the world safe for the expropriators. Ronald Reagan was right when he said, it's not nutmeg. It wasn't that our Grenada cut off our nutmeg supply, you know, bringing this country to its knees. <laughs> How can I eat my cinnamon bun? I need... <laughs> we can get perfectly good nutmeg from Africa, every bit as good as from Grenada. So it wasn't that. It's not just resource acquisition all the time. It, it, it was to make sure that, that no nation, no movement, no leader shall pursue an alternative way of using the land, the labor, the natural resources, the markets, and the capital of the country. And, and, that's, what, and that's what that was all about. And today in Grenada, those communal farms have been converted back to golf courses. Um, today, unemployment in Grenada is up about 20%, 25% or more. Um, and today, the tourist industry is back and the tourist companies and the big hotels are back while the people live in shacks and such. So it's, uh, it's the same thing they've been doing in Central America and, and many other places. The U.S. rulers have attacked many countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, and Central Asia now. Big in Central Asia now, lately, right? Uh, by our Nobel Peace Prize winner. What's his name, the guy in the White House? I, I block on it. The one who's always talking about folks. Us folks. Folks. Folks are going to want to... Folks are going to want to... He has that folksy way he talks. I puke in the answer. They don't, and, the, and who have they attacked? They have attacked only those that have attempted reformist or revolutionary uh, new kinds of approaches. Only those who have tried to get out from under the new world order. Only those who have tried to get out of the order of uh, transnational corporate capitalism. Um, they're attacked with trade wars, sanctions, financial strangulation, debt traps, Invasions, death squads, subversion, all sorts of things like that. Sometimes surrogate invasion, you know, use some other country to knock off this country and, and the one who's doing it gets paid off. Like, for instance, in Indonesia knocking off East Timor or something like that. Indonesians, the Indonesian government is, is, a, is, a, is a fascist, militarist government which was put in there by the U.S. back totally. Uh, and, and at a, a huge massacre, again, st closing down all the libraries, all the uh, clinics and everything that had built by, by Sukarno. 
uh, and one of his, one of only one of his his coalition government, one component was made up of the Indonesian Communist Party. Most of them were massacred, and their sin was building the libraries and clinics and 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 better roads and better housing. All of that's gone now. Indonesia is a totally untrammeled, untouched free market system. Um, so, and those who try to get out from under this uh, transnational grip are called anti-American. They're called hostile to us. They're called a potential threat. People like Iran, like Venezuela, for instance. Chavez, oh, he wants it. He's still selling the oil, and he asked for, repeatedly asked for friendly relations. They've got nothing to lose by having friendly relations and not have the U.S. on their neck, but that's not what they end up getting. <clears throat> this process of expropriating, where the ruling interest in one country expropriates the land, labor, natural resources, wealth, uh, capital uh, of another country, um, that process is called imperialism. Imperialism is what empires do. Um, and that's, you know, if you want to know something about the literature, in 1995 I wrote a book called Against Empire, and it was about U.S. policy. And I had all sorts of people, um, not all sorts, two or three, saying, oh, Parenti, you're going over, there you go, over the top again, empire, we don't have an empire, you don't use the word empire. And it's true, you could ne never use the word empire for the U.S., there was the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, the British Empire, the French Empire, the Soviet Empire, the most menacing, wickedest of all, ready to lurch at us and cut our throats open until they gave up and retired from the thing. Um, but not America. You wouldn't call America an empire. So I was alone out there with that book, Against the Empire. Actually, it's done pretty well. But, uh, but this one is much updated, better. Book. Um, <laughs> And um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, yeah. In the year 2000, five years after that book came out, all sorts of books started coming out about empire. Sorrows of empire, the follies of empire, empire at the, at the door, or whatever it is, empire here. And, there. and they were all referring to the United States as empire. I said, that's amazing. They're actually calling America an empire. Um, and um, and, I, and I, I was puzzling over it. And then when I looked more closely at these books, I realized they were using the term in that other way I was just saying, just power for power's sake, and nothing about the political economy, nothing about capitalism. <gasps> that word, you know, that you mustn't you say that word in a talk, and and you you risk not getting that journalist's job, not getting that tenure, not getting that whatever else. Um, they were just saying, we're an empire, just meaning uh, empire was thought of in terms of dominion, that it's just have a reach. And you know, those remember those old movies about Rome used to see? Empires, when I wrote my book, uh, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, I actually m immersed myself for almost two years as, as a classics uh, going into R Roman stuff, uh, it was actually a, it's a book about ancient Rome and, the, and about the, about why Caesar was really assassinated. And uh, what I discovered is the literature, the scholarly literature on on empire is rather positive toward empire. It's positive toward these murderous, plundering, aggrandizing organizations. Empire is seen as a as a thing that goes out there and and gives organization a lot of squabbling tribes and, and Rome comes along and, and builds roads and makes it orderly and makes it neat and all that. Most of the movies we see, remember those? Rome, Rome shall prevail, Rome. And, all, and you sit there and you go, yeah, yeah. And not realizing Rome was, was a bunch of murderers, you know, um, overlooking little things like that. I'm digressing here. Where was I about the process? Oh, and what was missing was imperialism in all these new books about empire. 
I mean, even conservatives, right wingers, you'd see on the talk shows, they say, "Well, we're now an empire. We're we're the only superpower, and we've got an empire, and we've got to act like an empire. We've got responsibilities, and we got as if the, this immense power gave them a certain entitlement to go beat up on other people in other countries, and such." Well, as I say, imperialism is what empires do. <clears throat> Now, somebody say to you, you mean they really, they go off and they, they got to just, they go off and they put in these SAPs, you know, structural adjustment programs with the IMF coming in and saying, you've got a debt now, make them go into debt and, and um, their trade falls off and their debt is worse than they anticipated and you really give them a tough time and it, it becomes an excuse to roll back their social wage and eliminate it to make their people hungrier, to privatize things, hand, hand over the stuff. Okay. Um, and um, do you really think they do that? Would they do that in, in all these places? I said, they're doing it here. They're doing it. The plutocracy is doing that here, cutting back on our social programs, using debt as a bludgeon, as an excuse for, for not having to... Uh, not having to pursue such social programs and give yourself over to luxuries like housing and, and, and education and medical care. You know? Yeah, that's exactly it. The same things that the empire does abroad, they do to themselves also. Um, and recessions occur. Recessions, brothers and sisters, recessions occur, as Karl Marx said over 150 years or more ago, Recessions occur when workers aren't paid enough money to buy back the goods and services that they produce. Uh, if you keep cutting costs, laying off people, doing speed ups, making seven workers do the work now that ten workers used to do, and you get it tighter and tighter, and you pay out less and less, and you produce more and more, um, who's going to buy all this stuff? Well, at first, you know, first of all, they buy a lot of it. The, they, they buy their jet planes and they buy their uh, Rolls Royces and their jewelries and their works of art and this and that. They, the consumption by the 1% goes up dramatically, as is happening right now. Um, and then they have a certain stratum that they need that's equipped and such, and they give them something, a tiny little, little professional uh, adjunct uh, class. And 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 then and then and then what we did from the 1980s and such right up to 2007 was people were were buying were using their credit cards and using their mortgages refinancing mortgages and such and living living off that and what's happened is that's all that's all pretty much gone now the uh, credit card debt has uh, has something like. Uh, Oh, I forget. It went up 75 percent in, in, from 1997 to 2007. And Fred Magdoff, who was in the audience, t telling me another great debtor class we have uh, now, probably the greatest debtor class are right among us, stand, some of them standing in the back, uh, and that's students. That students may now be, Fred, what was it? What was it? 80, 80 billion dollars? 800 billion dollars? The student debt in America today? So that's what starts happening when you say, well, who's going to buy all this? Where's the, where's the demand going to come from? And don't forget, it's not human need. Capitalism does not respond to human need. You may need shoes. You may need medical care. You may need housing. But that doesn't interest me. It's when that need or want, if you want something, which you may need or you may not need it, but you may want it, if that want is coupled with buying power, with money, and that's what they never talk about need. They talk about demand, consumer demand. There's people who have money who are going to buy something. And that's the problem we have. So we're in this recession. But recessions are not such bad things, ladies and gentlemen. Not for everyone. For the plutocracy, for the corporate elites who own most or much of this country, the recession is a great time to wipe out smaller competitors. You have big capital beating the stuff out of small capital, buying them up at uh, bargain basement 
prices and the like, pushing them out some way. Labor unions are tamed ever more, even more, and sometimes even broken. Uh, labor itself, not the labor union, but your own human labor is tamed even more. You work harder for less pay. Uh, you forget uh, benefits. You have people now uh, uh, passing off passing off on their vacations. If they go take their vacation, there's a good chance they, when they come back, uh, the, the, the door will be locked for them. Um, so, so they're working harder, longer, sometimes they're working overtime. Now it's a question of people getting paid for overtime. In my day, overtime, overtime pay was time and a half. Remember that? So if you made a dollar an hour, overtime pay was a dollar fifty an hour. Now there's a question of even paying people for overtime. So this recession, as they say, is a jobless recovery. It's massive hardship, but it's record profits also. And recessions also advance privatization. As state and local governments lose revenues, they sell off natural resources, they sell off public parks, they sell off public infrastructures, bridges, utilities, trains, uh, <clears throat> bus lines, prisons, schools. They close other services. The city of Oakland, California, which you've seen in the news, Occupy Oakland uh, recently, you know, it really infuriated me. I live, I live about 10 blocks from the o Oakland border in South Berkeley, and uh, it really infuriates me. You see these cops standing there when they get into their battle gear, you know, their war gear, and they're standing there, and each one of these cops must have about, what, three to $5,000 worth of equipment on them. Bulletproof vest, the Darth Vader helmet, the, uh, the, the taser, the mace gun, the the uh, percussion grenades. What the hell is a cop in a civil society doing a with a percussion grenade? Well, go to your website. You can see him pulling the grenade when Scott Olson had been hit by the tear gas and people got gathered around him. He was standing just as far away as, as I'm from you. Pull the grenade and toss it right in at the people. Can bust people's eardrums or hurt them in some other way. Um, and so here are these guys. These are, this, this, this is the Oakland cops who, who can't even answer a call. They resent it when their donuts and coffee time is taken and intruded upon them. These are the same cops who say, we don't have the budget anymore for, uh, 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 for crimes against property. It's only crimes against person that we, we're going to respond to. What a nice thing to announce, huh? To break in artists and such and all that. This is the same city that can't afford, but, but when it comes to the cops, wow, they got them out there. They get federal funds for that too. You know, this is the same city of Oakland that's just closing 14 of its 18 libraries. You know, I was raised in East Harlem in New York, Manhattan. It was called Italian Harlem in those days. It was an Italian working class neighborhood, blue collar neighborhood. That was my family. We were very poor. You got a problem with that? No, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> But I remember, I remember the library as being a kind of oasis because it was a pretty tough environment. And I remember that when I got tired of hanging around the pool room or the handball court or the street, I wouldn't get tired, I'd get bored sometimes. I, I'd go to the library. I'd walk up to 125th Street, I'd go to this library branch and there were these books. And it wasn't that I had any great intellectuality campaign or something like that. It was that... Um, it was just that it was a window out to other places. It was like an opening, uh, that, that longing for things yet to come and, uh, and to read about all sorts of odd things in history and science and whatever else. It, it was great. And, and you know, and I st that's the first thing I thought when they said Oakland closing 14 of their 18 libraries. I said, isn't that, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the best thing to do for the kids of the city of Oakland. Close the library. For some of those kids, it would probably be the only quiet place uh, and the only place where they can gather themselves. So, so that's, that's what privatization does. It impoverishes even the local governments. And that's what imperialism does. The empire feeds off the republic. And so the republic starves while the empire bloats and gets bigger and bigger and fatter and meaner. Um, oh.
talk among yourselves a minute while I get this. There was a talk by Robert Reich I heard. It was a very good talk. He was making about uh, policy in Washington and all that. And then he ruined the whole talk for me. He ruined it by the, at the end. He said, too bad there isn't anybody in Washington with at least half a brain to deal with this. And the audience all laughed and all that. And I'm saying to myself, what's he talking about? He thinks, that he's being very stupid. So he thinks those people are stupid. He thinks they're handling this recession this way because they're stupid. They're just not as smart as we are. No, they're handling it this way because that's the way they want to do it. They want a jobless recovery. Uh, they want, they're making record profits and wealth accumulation. More money than they know what to do with. Warren Buffett just uh, started, I read this in the Wall Street Journal. Warren Buffett was, is buying up his own stock for Hawthorne. And, and the Wall Street Journal, amazing, I didn't know that the reporter could get away with saying this. I mean, stock is something you print up to get people's cash. And here he's using his cash to, pick, to, to, to soak up this paper. And, and so the, the, the reporter said, this does prove that there are some businesses that have more money than they know what to do with, you know. And that's what's going on. They're doing well. They're not stupid. And so with foreign policy, it's not stupid. We constantly hear that. In the, the, the face of imperialism, I have, a, I think, a, a good solid half a page of adjectives that are used to describe U.S. foreign policy. I'll read only a few of them. Inept, reckless, misguided, overreaching, arrogant, deluded, aggrandizing, um, well-intentioned, but, you know, misled, but uh, sucker, you know, confused, confused. So you're just smarter than all of these presidents and administrations and all of these agencies. Is that it? They just, aren't you stupid for not asking, how is it they're constantly so stupid, all these tens and twenties and thirties of years? How is that? They keep doing these things and you keep calling them stupid. And the liberal critic is never happier than when he can rock back on his heels and say, how stupid they are, how stupid. No, you're stupid when you think your enemies who are beating the hell out of the world and you and, 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 and getting richer off our blood, sweat, and tears, you're stupid when you think they're stupid. Richard Cohen, columnist for the Washington Post for about 30 years now or more, Here's how you get to be a columnist and stay a columnist for the Washington Post. You write sentences like this. The Iraq war is not the product of oil avarice or CIA evil. And we didn't say it was sim those two simple things. I'm, I'm saying something else about containment, right? It's the, it's the product of a surfeit of altruism, a naive, a naive compulsion to do good. So there it is. That's what it is. And then he cites George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz as examples of compulsive do-gooders who, <laughs> who suffer from this uh, surfeit of altruism. They just can't stop doing good here, you know. So, so don't. Next time anybody says how stupid they are, you say no, no. They're very smart. How, why do you call the people who own the world stupid and who control everything, control the media, control the military and all that sort of thing? It's a very rational and consistent policy. The U.S. empire builders support, it's as simple as this, they support those dictators or democratically elected governments that follow the new world order of free market capitalism. These U.S. empire builders oppose those dictators or democratic governments that seek an alternative to free market capitalism. It has nothing to do with humanitarian wars. It has nothing to do with democracy. They'll use democracy as a window dressing. They'll use it as a front, sure. But they'll destroy democracies. They'll put up showcase democracies and, and hold elections. Look, they're going to hold a, 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 this. Never mind. <clears throat> no, I'm getting, I'm getting Liberia mixed up with Libya. I just made a mistake. And so, OK. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the case right from the Arab Spring, so-called. Right here, two countries right next to each other. A dictator who ruled his country for 30 years without stint. 
I'm talking about Mubarak in Egypt. And another dictator in Libya who did horrible things like kick out the oil company, oil corporations, take the oil earnings and use them to build schools, education, housing, uh, medical care, and the like. Um, Gaddafi, and who also at, ruled dictatorial, it's true. Well, what did they do with Mubarak? I'll tell you what they did. That Obama and his friend Hillary, right down to the last days, they were still defending Mubarak and saying nice things about him and saying, let's be patient and let's have some nice, gradual, gentle change. That's what they were doing right to the last day until it became impossible and they couldn't support him anymore because nobody in Egypt was supporting him, not even his own military. It was like Reagan with Marcos in the Philippines, remember? He was saying, he's an all right guy. He's all right. And when finally they had, to, they had to go find a new face because the people were against it, the clergy, the church was against it, and the military, the generals hated Marcos for all sorts of reasons about favoritism and corruption, in-house reasons, not because, not because they had a, a, a new political economic agenda. So you, you just put in some new faces and you go for it. But with Gaddafi, they, they had him labeled as a wicked, evil man from a long time ago. And there they waged a, a humanitarian war where they bombed Libya's houses, utilities, ports, factories, farms, and the like. Gaddafi, remember Gaddafi built that whole aquifer system, took that wonderful aquifer, that incredible resource of water, pure water from southern Libya, brought it north to all the people in the cities and farms. Most of the population is in the north. And he did it all without IMF. He refused to have the IMF meddling in there. Mubarak had the IMF all over him, you know, messing up one thing after another because the IMF ultimately looks after the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which is the organized arm of finance capitalism in the world. So that's the difference. That was Gaddafi's real sins. Do you really think they went in because they were suddenly worried for humanitarian reasons that somebody was getting killed? People are getting killed and murdered and thrown into jail without trial, like right here in Guantanamo, come to think of it. But all over the world, do you think they suddenly just felt they had to do this about Libya? Was that it really? And they had to wage a humanitarian war while their allies were... Saudi Arabia and countries of that ilk. Um, okay. Well, how do the empire builders get the American people to go along with this? I wrote a book called Super Patriotism. I said there were two things. One is the messianic appeal. We are God's uh, answer to humankind and we are here to help and deliver the lesser people, to teach them democracy and all that stuff. There's that appeal, but the real thing that wins support is fear. Um, back in 91, the, the, the polls were showing Gulf War I, the first one with, uh, with uh, Bush Sr. Uh, the American population, despite all the propaganda and all the one-sided things that were thrown at it, 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 um, it voted overwhelmingly against going in. Then they said, if Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, well, they didn't, that term wasn't in vogue yet. They said, if Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, would you want us to go in and he might use them? Then, then, the, then the percentages shifted. So that's where they started hitting. Saddam Hussein, worse than Hitler, a real danger. Any day he can attack. And when people are convinced suddenly that they are not, they and their children and family and whatever are not safe, um, they will they will then step in line and salute the flag and follow it, and the flag is wrapped around the president who's ready to drop bombs and do that sort of thing. So, so that's what it, it's all about. And that's true. I gave you the example of Mubarak and Gaddafi. There's too many other variables there, you could say. Okay, what if I give you the example of one, one person, one man, and that's Saddam Hussein. When Saddam Hussein... His first gig was with the CIA, and that was to murder the prime minister of Iraq. He was a prime minister, democratically elected, a coalition government that had just kicked out the oil companies and was beginning to pursue a reformist policy in Iraq. Saddam Hussein shot him and didn't kill him. The CIA guy hustled him away and into a, a 
a safe house. And later on, later on with enough death squads, enough disruption, enough everything else, he took over the Baathist party and took over the government. And Saddam Hussein murdered or drove into exile or underground every constitutionalist, every democrat, every reformer, every communist, every socialist uh, that was around in sight. And when he was killing people and murdering people in substantial numbers, when he was at his most murderous stage, he was Washington's poster boy. They loved him. They kissed him. He couldn't be seen. They, they'd come and travel to to, uh, to Baghdad and take had their pictures taken with him and all. He was wonderful. Then he started doing funny things, troublesome things. He started getting out of line on the oil quotas. He wanted a bigger quota of the market. Contrary to what was told to the American public that he would take away your gasoline and your fuel, it's just the opposite. They want to be able to sell, get into that market. And he did certain other things. He did not privatize, he did not privatize the country. It was in fact he kept it state-owned. As Rumsfeld said, it looks like a Stalinist economy. I thought that was an amusing set of words. And so suddenly he was now a demon. And that's when they went in and they got after him. That was the crucial difference. Are you on this side of the Great Divide or that side? Are you going to work for the world order uh, or are you going to uh, not? The empire, I'm going to finish up right here. I'm sorry, I've been talking too long. Uh, I, I, it's, it's hot as hell in here too, isn't it? Let's open that door. The empire sees only two types of states beyond its borders. Either you're a satellite, a vassal state, also called a client state, the one that says, come on in boys, it's all yours, whatever you want, take it. Just give my brother Jose and me, or my brother Abdul and me, a, a little payoff here and, and you know we'll take care of it. They get out of line, we'll crack their heads and it's all yours. That's the vassal state. Or you follow, or, or you could be an ally. An ally is a more sophisticated relationship, but it's essentially the same where we follow the same path as you because we have the same plutocracy and, 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 uh, and we're with you in tune. The other kind of state that the empire sees is enemy or potential enemy. Either you are in this world order or if you're not, you are potentially a, a cause of trouble and we will go after you. As I said, the empire feeds off the republic. It's a rich global military power. There are those people who say the empire is in decline. There's a whole literature coming out now about twilight of empire and the like. But uh, I don't really see that yet at all. I mean, the military budgets are as big and powerful as ever. They now have opened a massive base in Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan, a place they never dreamed they would have it, in Kosovo, a huge one. And they'll have the green zone in Iraq even after the troops come home. Um, so the empire is as strong as ever. Now it is true that uh, what, what people see is the republic in decline. They see all sorts of things declining here and they think that that's what the problem, that that's the empire. But, um, and it also is true that ultimately an empire like any parasite can kill its host by over by draining and sucking from it. Well, the alternative, I say, what I think the alternative is to capitalism is socialism. I support socialism. And I don't mean these two big isms in this big global momentous clash that they're supposed to be in. I mean, um, can somebody lower the heat? Anybody can find it? What? Don't you? Aren't you all feeling it too? Or is it just me putting you to sleep? Uh, I come from California. This is pretty cold weather, let me tell you. No, it's okay. I I, I respond best to a slow rhythmic clapping. Go ahead. <laughs> Rather than thinking of these two great isms where one is clashed and is in retreat and the other is now taking everything over, look at the reality of things. I support socialism because in some areas it works so much better than capitalism. 
you don't have people there siphoning it off. Imagine building a medical system that whose ultimate function is profit, private profit. Not delivering help and saving lives, but private profit is its ultimate. That begins to create problems. So I say socialism works because health care in Finland, in France, in Norway, Sweden is much, much better than it is here. It's, it's, it's a rotten. It's, it's, a, it's a crime what it is here. I believe education, I believe education is better, um, better here. You know, I, when I taught at State University of New York, years before I came to, to Vermont, UVM, I remember students saying, um, socialism, I, I, how could it even work? I mean, how did, I can't even imagine it. And I said, well, you're sitting in it right now, you know? I mean, here was a publicly run institution and it was, uh, and the, the quality of teaching and scholarship and research and students and such was certainly as good as and better than most of the private schools on Long Island in those days. Um, it was very good. And, and instead of you having to pay whatever it was, 10000 you only had to pay something like, I think it was $300 a semester as a registration fee. Of course, what they're doing, what we're do what's happening in this country is the other way. There's a gradual privatization of higher education by simply raising tuition fees, tuition fees. So, so in effect, these become public schools that are run like private schools. Um, utilities, the utilities in this country that are publicly owned are, have lower rates than the private utilities. And not only that, but the earnings go right back into the budget. They don't go into some rich stockholders' pockets and the like. They're not siphoning off, you see. Why should you, why when you put a light on, should somebody be making a profit off that? Um, transportation, environmental care, banking, the one state in the union, the one of maybe two or three in the whole union that did not suffer terrible financial crises uh, in those recent years was North Dakota. It's the only state with a state-owned bank. Uh, there's a book on this too. Somebody wrote recently, and, I, and of course, I forget the author and title, but, um, and, and that's because the, 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 the wealth of the state is, is deposited in their own banks. It's not given over to these bankers. You know what the bankers do. I'll end, I'll end I, I, speaking of bankers, I'll end on that. I'll end by quoting Giulio Tremonti. You know who Giulio Tremonti is? Giulio Tremonti is the besieged finance minister of Italy. And he once said, he's in the Berlusconi, right-wing fascist government. And Berlusconi says about him, he says, oh, he's a socialist, but I know him so long, that's why I don't fire him. But Tremonti says, Salva, salvate il popolo non le banche. Save the people, not the banks. And that's what we got to do. Save the people, not the banks. <laughs> what? Sure. I talked too long, though. Did I run too long? No? No? Okay, no, it wasn't too long. Okay. So before uh, people take off, just a reminder of Michael's book. There's a bunch of them over there that we'd love to have um, you the take home. Yeah. Here's the commercial. Um, if there are any people who have any quick announcements about some political events that they want to share right now, we could do that first, and then uh, Michael's willing to do a few questions and answers. Um, so, announcements first. Alex? Great, thank you. Uh, I just on this evening. Um, the cops came down in the dozens with giant tear gas canister uh, launchers with tasers in hand with paintball guns. It's quite clear that the movement of the 99% to reject the 1% wars, empire, and spending of social money is, uh, is, is actually threatening to them. I won't, I, I can rant forever. Um, I simply want to announce that uh, there was a, a tackler retreat back to the Unitarian Church tonight, um, which was opened up for the occupiers. Um, and there's a general assembly tonight at nine to discuss retaking the park, um, just as the police crackdown in Oakland led to a retreat, mass mobilization, and a retaking of the park. Um, 
And it's absolutely going to take this sort of grassroots movement and fight back, just like what we saw in the rejection of the Vietnam War, that's going to change the system of the 1% and its empire. Destroying the pup tents and cleaning it, just wiping them out and all that, or are they leaving them alone for now? The mayor was in uh, quite the predicament. We actually forced him to uh, 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 demand the release of uh, one person that the police had taken, um, and, uh, and we ultimately did get him to swear not to actually bring down the tents. But this is the same man that invited the occupiers into City Hall to discuss the situation um, after, after, after the, 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 uh, the incident early today, and it was while we were in that meeting that the dozens and dozens of, I mean, 30, 40 police, that, uh, that's when they took the camp. So it's really unclear. The mayor said one thing, but, you know, he said many things. Um, so it's unclear, but right now it looks like that's not the case. So Orin and, Orin and then Dave? Yeah, just real quickly, I think, you know, uh, everything that Sam said is totally true in other cities where things like this happen. People come down in solidarity and help out. So at 9 o'clock or whatever, more people that could come down and help in solidarity and stand with the people from Occupy Burlington will be less chance to have police violence which occurs when the police move in. And it's actually planning the action for taking back the park tomorrow. So stay plugged in to hear what, what's going to be going on tomorrow. And I'll the park or the chair the church? The General Assembly is at the church tonight at 9 to plan the, uh, the, the retake of the park tomorrow. Um, and that will be announced through all the listservs, through everything, and I'll certainly announce it on the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Street. What church? The Unitarian Church the is at the, top church of, that's at the top of Church Street. And the more people, the more people, the more support there is then, I think, and that, that, that registers on that. I don't think, you know, don't think that uh, the powers that be are not interested in what you have to say or what you think. That's the only thing they're interested in about you, is what you're thinking. They don't care what you eat, they don't care if you live or die, they don't care if you're overstressed or underpaid, they don't care about any of that, but they do care about what you're thinking, what's on your mind. Every day they worry about it. They check all the opinion polls all the time. They, they support, half of the things they ever utter is to manipulate your thought, is to get you to be thinking the way they want you to think. So, so much of the fight is an ideological fight. I mean, we are so ideologically underdeveloped on the left. The, the right wingers understand that to control people, you've got to control their minds. To control their minds, you've got to give them labels and images and narratives and ideologies and thoughts and that sort of thing. Now, we don't want to control your mind. I believe it's not ideology, it's an analysis of what's really happening. Why do the police act this way? Why? Why do they act this way in almost every city around? What, what, what is it that they are protecting? What is it that they are fighting back or beating back? This is, when you start thinking and asking these kind of questions, that to me was what was so marvelous about, about the um, Occupy uh, movement is, is, is many of the signs had an ideological dimension which you rarely see in U.S. protests. You see, end the war, stop the this, do the that, but here, but here you'd have them saying capitalism is this, socialism would be that, or or uh, or um, the one I saw right down right down at o Occupy Burlington, just a little cardboard sign outside somebody's pup tent. He said, he said, soon the people will have nothing left to eat but the rich. <laughs> I mean that's that's brilliant. You can't make up that stuff. You can't get a a, a two man committee together to think up all those things. That's the democracy in the streets realizing itself. I have an, I have an article out on my blog called um, Occupy America. Which I, just, I finished it a couple of hours before I raced off to catch the plane to come out this way. So if you get a chance, go take a look at that. Should we have questions uh, now? Well, oh, you one quick announcement, and Helen, one quick announcement, and then let's do questions and answers. Let's try and right be now, quick. Right now, Burlington is, is the key focal point, I think, for us. I'm going to be headed down after the thing. If anyone is interested, I'm probably going to be going back down to Washington in, I think, about two weeks. Who's this uh, December 6th, you can see Who's what this? we've been doing down there for hmm? a couple of months now. Uh, you can just go to October2011.org. Uh, 
Um, we think we're holding on to Freedom Plaza, so far, and going out and doing actions of our own, or actions in conjunction with Tar Sands and other groups on a daily basis. Um, I'm probably going to drive down this time, and uh, there'll be some space in the car, and you can find me at Blue Rock. The Peace and Justice Center will know other uh, lecture series uh, or just get a hold of Vets for Peace. Can you tell us who you are? David, David Ross. Vets for Peace. I thought he, I knew that. He's with Vets for Peace. No, I know. <laughs> so, um, I'm Joan Scott. I'm in the Conference Committee in that will um, help establish um, and uh, I'm also in the Labour Working Group of the Occupy Burlington movement and um, you may have heard that, <coughs> that Occupy Wall Street New York put out a call for labor unions to come out on a day of solidarity on November 17th. It's called Resist, Rebuild, Reclaim. November 17th, join the 99%. Resist austerity, rebuild the economy, reclaim our democracy. And here in Burlington, we're having a day of action. It's going to be a rally at 5.15 at the post office um, to save stop them laying off postal workers. There's going to be a march and then there's going to be a teaching speak out called Making Trouble for the 1%, um, followed by a Put People First community meeting. So it's a, an evening of solidarity events that people should definitely come from, come to for the reasons that people have said. And read Michael's um, brilliant piece on the Occupy movement. This is doing exactly the kinds of things that he says we would have to do next. Helen is also one of our board members and works incredibly hard to secure a room space and financial support for our lecture <coughs> Okay, so questions now and, um, as opposed to announcements? Well, maybe there are more organizational things that people have. That? To, yeah, if there are okay. a few other things pertaining to the events that are occurring right now. Which are which are my check, my check. Yeah, yeah let the old guy talk. <laughs> I want to uh, tell you what the private press coverage for the opposed the tar sands project has been very mediocre. The Washington demonstration was inspiring. There were twelve thousand estimated people encircling the White House. From Vermont, there were over 250 people. Well, wow. ready for Vermont. We <laughs> understand that the President Obama has announced a delay in the decision. It was supposed to be by December 31st, <coughs> been postponed till after the election. Now, this is good <laughs> news. Yeah. Every delay in that damn thing makes it less likely to happen. New environmental impact. He's a slippery little slimy. <laughs> no, he, he was for it. He was for it, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. He was all for it. Oh, we need this energy. We'll be energy independent. And now he's saying, well, I'm going to wait on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but let's see. That's, that's, yeah, when they have to wait, that's a good sign that there's at least some kind of counter pressure, you know. If they don't feel any kind of counter pressure, man, they will roll all over us. We will be, I mean, you know, you can forget that. Watch the gold in your teeth. They'll, they'll take that out of you, too, which has been done, historically speaking. Um, yeah. Yes, as part of bringing it home to Vermont, um, our governor uh, uh, is uh, a supporter of the uh, uh, anti-pipeline, uh, and he's done some pretty good things, but uh, the very core of his priorities are an extension of the Wall Street priorities. He is, uh, is, as a matter of fact, today there was a, uh, a legislative session in Montpelier to discuss his budgetary cuts. He wanted to cut 4% from the elderly, from education, from uh, the mentally ill. And yeah. he refused. All the frivolous fringe things, right? Yeah, and he refused a, a piddling 1.5 surtax on the $190 million windfall from the extension of the Bush tax cuts. He himself is a 10 millionaire and a 1 percenter. Uh, he uh, seems to be a nice guy, but that's part of, of the deception. That's uh, part, of, part of the deceptive coloring. And I wish more people would uh, work to hold his feet to the fire in regard to a more reasonable budget and one that uh, creates a fairer tax base and one that uh, uh, forces the wealthier Vermont. I mean, 
there's the mythology that uh, they're going to flee Vermont, and he has said so, although then he turned around and rejected that idea that the wealthy will flee. But uh, we have that fight here in Vermont with our own governor. Thank you. Matt? Hi. Um, when I talk, I just want to talk and represent um, John's at the State College. We have three groups here today. Um, John's an occupied group there. that we formed this semester as well. Um, we also are having a day of solidarity, but it's actually tomorrow on Johnson campus at 11. We will have teach-ins, we have speakers, um, we will be occupying the campus. Uh, there will be a general assembly. Um, so I just want to announce that if anybody's in the local area, um, that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow, a day of solidarity. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, City Hall, down, down. Occupy Burlington. I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, obviously these are not normal times. Um, I had my first job in 1963 as a steel worker, and I was cut apart, and I was bleeding on the floor, and my shop steward wouldn't stop it, my foreman wouldn't stop it, but the workers laid down all they shut down the plant. This is oh. National Can Corporation. This is 1963. Today, the Champlain Valley Labor Council Executive Committee, representing 17 affiliated unions in the Chittenden, Franklin County, and Grand Isle area, voted in favor of the November, March, 17 March, and uh, rally, and it gives you some idea of what's happening in this country. I'm not saying it's easy for people that are workers that come from my age to make this move, but they're beginning to make it. And it's going to change this country like it changed a lot of the Middle East, and that battle is not over yet. My last point about this is to invite you all, and this is an advertisement, see that magazine? Well, it's Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. There's also in a magazine that's published out of here, it's actually a, a web magazine called Toward Freedom. It's not enough to have consciousness, class consciousness about where you come from as a working class person. You have to understand Who's ruling this country? So I invite you all to see a column I'm starting called The One Percent on toardfreedom.com. Thank you. Who's your local ruling class? Yeah, what do you? One question to our guest. One more thing of 
Wait, we have one. There's somebody here. I just want to say that what our progressive mayor and our police force are doing is exactly what the country is doing, blaming its ills on the poor. What's going on here is a man commits, a veteran commits suicide, as many veterans are committing suicide, and they're blaming Occupy for this man committing suicide when Occupy has given him probably the most help he's gotten in a long time. So they're saying this is a reason to get them out of here, when the real reason is that our city and our state and our country failed this man, not Occupy. And they're using the incident to come down on the occupiers. They're using an incident that probably isn't even connected. Question. One question for our guest. I want to just thank you. Yeah, you brought me out here. You might as well ask. I do want to say ditto, ditto, ditto to everything that you said. It does my soul good. But you talk about labels, and I'd like you to comment. We talk about, and you refer, and many do, to the American empire. I would suggest that it's not the American empire, because we are the American people. It's not our empire. Okay? So can we come up with a better label? A yeah. global, uh, a global money-powered empire that's taken over the world. So instead right. of referring to it as American, can we give it another label? Yeah, it's a, it's a corporate empire, and the the plutocracy in England, and France, and Germany, and Nigeria, and Indonesia. They're all they're all uh, subscribed members to this empire too. Yeah, it's a class empire. You're right, and you mustn't think of it as America going into these places, uh, or, or even the past empires. It wasn't America, you know. The the, the ordinary Brit uh, who was trying to keep body and soul together was not planning or thinking or demanding that they go conquer India. In fact, he ended up dying and bleeding in India for for the for the queen and the crown and all that. So it's empires are class are class things, and you should always think in those terms. Uh, I, but I thought the analysis was a class class analysis. Yeah. Question. Um, Question. Charlotte. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, there's an irony here. You are from Oakland. And well, no, I, I'm across the border. Yeah, near Oakland. All right. An event got hit, and that spread the movement. People got very angry. We have an incident now in Burlington. And so I'm hoping that what you'll do is that when you go back, you send our words of solidarity with Oakland, and maybe Oakland will send their words of solidarity with us. Well, you guys can do it directly, can't you? Except I don't know who, who to send it to. I'm not sure. I, I can, I'll ask around. Uh, <laughs> Well, I was invited to sp I was invited to speak at uh, at uh, Occupy Wall Street, and then I was invited to speak at Occupy Boston. I told both of them, "Gee, I'm at the wrong end of the continent. I can't do that." But I haven't been invited to speak at uh, Occupy Berkeley or a prophet is without honor in his own village. You know, <laughs> that's the way it goes. They, they know me, so they don't want me. You know, <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. If I had if I had planned my plane tickets differently, I might have taken you up on it. Uh, Another question. Back? There's, oh, there's a guy over there. Too. He stood up for me for the tenure battle, and I stood up for him for his tenure battle too. You know, yeah. um, and um, I think he got tenure because you didn't. Th that's no, what he always said. Uh, yeah. that. That, that, that it was such an uproar about my not getting tenure that when he came up for tenure, they started again, and people said, "Oh, we're sick of this." What is? And, and he he got through. That's right. I even got Raoul Hilberg to to say to me, "Oh, I I want Will Miller to have his contract renewed." Boy, that was a big, he said it to me over the phone. I never heard it in public. Uh, <clears throat> Michael was supposed to be our first speaker. Directly, he didn't, uh, he wasn't well that day. Uh, that, no, I had my whole back, yeah. I, I, I even, I, and I also canceled the trip to Paris. I had a keynote. 
I would... But this was more important. This was more important. Those were two big things, but I tell you, Paris... This empire might fall and take us all down with it. I mean, if it lasts too long, it could be too costly, and um, we're having a, we're having a terrible time. Uh, 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 what's at stake now is not just social justice, but the environment itself. So, um, and it could take a long time. You know, uh, the British Empire lasted 150 years. The Roman Empire lasted centuries. Um, so I don't know. I, w I wish, I wish you were right that um, that the empire is in decline, but of course, if the republic is in such serious decline, that's got to affect the empire eventually. I mean, I, I, the empire has certain weak points. One is recruitment of uh, per personnel. That's why Obama is so in love with his drones. The drones, they love them. And here's the this this is the weapon they've been dreaming of. No loss of life. It can go around. Be, control automatically and you can shoot down and kill everybody in the village and move on to the next one uh, without without a single soldier being lost because heavy loss of life becomes politically costly not because they're concerned about the lives of those soldiers they, they're not concerned about those lives as witnessed by what happens to them when they come home um, they're not concerned about that they're concerned about the political spin-off or effect of high casualty rates it's going to limit our hand as far as destroying this country or that country or that social movement. So, so, um, so that's so that might be a, a weak point. That if we can get at recruitment, uh, and and for a while it was true they were having a terrible time filling their recruitment quotas, but now with the recession they're getting a lot of kids, especially from inner city or small towns, who don't have Ze have nothing, zero, out of high school and such, and and the army thing looks like a good deal. It looks like a, a chance to be able to that be able to pay for their education with the GI Bill, and it's not true. The GI Bill today is not what it was in 1946. I could tell you that. Uh, many of the vets come back and they end up going. This is how the empire cares about its about its foot soldiers. They end up having to take out loans. They end up having to take jobs, second two jobs or something to try to go through school. Many of them give up. They said it's just too hard. This is too impossible. So the uh, so um, so that's one place. The, the, if if we could get people, that was happening with the Vietnam War. There were whole platoons and even companies. A few instances of company at company level, but platoons would go down the road and instead of making contact with the enemies, they go sit down and toke up. You know, they were fighting the war that way, which is a much more pleasant way to fight the war. And um, and and uh, and I remember the 101st Airborne Division troops on on um, 
on the bridge to uh, crossing the, Arling the Arlington Bridge where the veterans against the war, Viet the Vietnam veterans against the war came marching and there was the 101st uh, Airborne Division paratroopers, this is the elite crack unit, 82nd Airborne and 101st. And they, they refused to arrest them. They were ordered to arrest them. They said, we're not gonna arrest and rough up uh, you know, American veterans and all that. And Nixon got, it was like, you know, the czar, the Imperial Guard is not doing what I told him to do. And this looks like, what's, what, they're the only thing between me and the pitchforks, you know. And, and, but, so we just have to struggle on all fronts. That's one, that's one plan. I have another plan for, for this whole thing, but that involves guillotines, and I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> Good night. Good night, thank you. And I, I wanna say it's so great to be back in Vermont and see all the people in Boston.